All right, so this is chapter 15 that we're going over today. That is pharmacy operations management and workflow. In today's chapter, we will be learning the following information. So some of those learning objectives include, um, try to get my screen together. Some of those, Objectives include you should be able to list some common areas in a community pharmacy setting, as well as be able to discuss the general layout of a pharmacy uh, setting, especially in the community setting, as well as be able to describe the role of a pharmacy technician in a community setting. You should also be able to describe the general layout in various areas of an institutional pharmacy setting, as well as the role of a pharmacy technician in an institutional pharmacy setting. You'll also learn how to identify some ways to improve efficiency techniques because there's always uh, different ways to come to the same result. Um, but there are some ways that we can work on some techniques and I'll share that with you today. So as an overview, each pharmacy, regardless of the setting, whether it's hospital, whether it's community, um, even if it's managed care, each setting and pharmacy has specific tasks and technicians provide distributive functions as well as supportive roles. So as a pharmacy technician, we are basically the right hand to the pharmacist and assisting and supporting them in their duties. However, there are some things that we can do that's technical that does not require us to have a judgment call on things. So in regards to being a pharmacy technician, even in a community setting, there are ways we can assist the patients, answer the phones, help fill the prescriptions, help do inventory. Those are just some common duties that are done by a pharmacy technician in the community setting when it comes to institutional when you hear institutional you could think of uh, hospital pharmacy uh, other institutional settings uh, would be uh, could be closed door pharmacies such as uh, maybe an infusion pharmacy uh, just to give that as an example so ashp which stands for american society of health system pharmacists they provide a pharmacy practice model that has an initiative and a significant focus of advancing the health and well-being of patients. They have credentials for pharmacists. They even have a pharmacy technician membership where pharmacy technicians can learn more information and uh, even have some benefits to continuing education and pharmacy practices. So now that I've gone over a little bit of an overview, let's go into how the layout is in a community pharmacy. So in a community pharmacy, you can have what's called automated long-term care equipment. There are things that can assist with packaging medications in a long-term care facility as a pharmacy. Need to know LTC, stands for long-term care. So if ever you see that, you'll know that's what it means when it comes to medical. Now, an example of an automated long-term care equipment would be a sealer. And if you've ever seen a medication individually packaged, uh, they have two different types of seals. You have a cold seal. That's where you can basically take a film off of a packaging and then you can close it. I know you're getting a visual right now as far as, I'm sorry, I know you're getting an audio as in trying to visualize what this looks like, but there is a slide in a few moments that I'll give you an example of what that looks like. But in a long-term care uh, environment, as far as the equipment for packaging medications, there is a sealer that can seal a medic package so that the medicine won't come out and those blister cards which is another name for them the blister cards are used in most long-term care facilities so that the nursing uh, staff can distribute the medication to the patient some other areas in the community pharmacy would be the compounding area and this could be where the technician can help reconstitute a medication remember to reconstitute a medication means the medication comes in a powder form and 
perhaps maybe liquid needs to be added to it in order to activate it. An example would be an antibiotic such as amoxicillin that might come in powder form and then distilled water would have to be added to that bottle and then it could be shaken and then provided to the patient. Uh, just keep in mind, anything that needs to be reconstituted should be done after it is paid for. It is nothing like having someone change their mind and the medicine is already activated. And then that would be a loss of product. So you definitely want to make sure payment is received first before you reconstitute anything. Another area in the pharmacy is the counseling area, or sometimes they even have a counseling room. This is where patients can speak with a pharmacist one-on-one -on -one to get more information about their medication or about their health concerns in general. Uh, there is a room, I've seen some pharmacies that actually have rooms now, uh, and this is where it could really be a closed door conversation where they don't have to worry about they meaning the patient. They don't have to worry about anyone else overhearing their conversation. Uh, those types of rooms can also be used to administer immunizations. Uh, now, as I'm giving this presentation, I'm referring to Florida law. And in the state of Florida, only a pharmacist can administer immunizations in a pharmacy setting to a patient. Uh, the pharmacy technician can assist with gathering the correct uh, medicine or should I say the correct uh, vaccine and the proper syringe and the alcohol swab and the cotton balls and things like that to help set up the tray for the pharmacist to get ready to immunize, to immunize the patient. Another thing that a pharmacy technician can do in helping prepare uh, for a person to get immuniz immunizations is to take their uh, medical history and there is usually a form that a patient would have to fill out. So the pharmacy technician can make sure that that form is being filled out correctly and that nothing is being left blank and that they make sure uh, they ask all of the necessary and required questions. Another area that could be that's in a community pharmacy is the counter space for inventory check in and processing. So that counter space is going to be when an order comes in. Uh, let's say the pharmacy is low on some of their medications. Uh, numerous um, orders may come in from different vendors. Some pharmacies have different vendors. Some pharmacies have just one vendor. And those vendors are known as wholesale uh, wholesale pharmacies that would deliver the medicine to the pharmacy department. And when that order comes in, the pharmacy staff will have a place where if that medication can be emptied from the packaging onto the counter space and then separated individually by shelvings and then be put up correctly. Another area would be the data entry or the filling station. Uh, data entry is where the pharmacy technician is going to receive the prescriptions. This could be known as the drop-off station. Uh, this could also be utilized as where the pharmacy technician will take allergy information, telephone information, uh, even if a patient wanted to know uh, the price of a medicine, uh, the pharmacy technician could use uh, their computer system to get that information to the patient. Uh, there are some filling stations in the pharmacy, and this is where the technicians would fill the medicine that was prescribed for the patient. Uh, in some pharmacies, there is a drive through So this component has may have a phone available to that drive through so that technicians can speak or technicians or pharmacy staff can speak to the patient in regards to their medication. They'll even have what's called, um, it's like a tube. Uh, think of going to a bank and, you know, if you go through a drive through uh, to get your, uh, let's say you go into the bank, uh, you go to the drive through to either deposit money or to withdraw money and you send the money through a, what's called a pneumatic tube. Uh, they have that through the drive through for pharmacies, except for the person would just send their prescription through that way. Or if they're picking up, the pharmacy would then, you know, put the prescription in that uh, tube and then send it back to the patient. It's actually a cool feature, but uh, these are just some common areas in a community pharmacy setting. 
You also have what's called durable and non-durable equipment. Durable equipment are things that are going to last. These can be medical devices, such as a blood pressure machine or a diabetic uh, reader, something that's going to check the, uh, the sugar of the patient. Um, non-durable equipment uh, would be known as medical uh, equipment that can go along with the durable equipment. For example, if a person is diabetic, can they have a glucose testing machine? Uh, some non-durable equipment that could go with it would be some lancets. Lancets is going to be the needle that actually um, sticks the finger so that blood can come out. That patient could then also have another non-durable equipment known as the test strips. And the blood that's on, say, the person's finger is going to go on that test strip so that the test strip can absorb the blood. And then that test strip is going to go into the glucose testing machine to then read what the sugar is of the patient. I know, again, you're getting an audio, but I'm going to try to find another way of how to give you a visual of what all of those components look like. So those are just some examples of durable and non-durable equipment. So I like to think of durable equipment as something that can last a long time and non-durable equipment for something that's like a one-time use. So like a lancet would be a one-time use, or should I say should be a one-time use. Same thing like a needle or a syringe. If someone had insulin and they needed to get injected with their insulin, that's known as a non-durable um, equipment. So another area in the community pharmacy is the front counter. This is where the register is. This is where uh, the patient would be picking up their medications and then also offering payment for those medications, if any. At the front counter also, uh, behind that front counter, which is known as BTC, behind the counter, that is where the pseudoephedrine would be or maybe even depending on the pharmacy, sometimes people have the glucose monitors back there or uh, the syringes. Um, the syringes would be uh, behind the counter as well. Uh, these are things that do not require a prescription, but still need to be purchased at the pharmacy counter. So these are just some examples of some areas that's in the community pharmacy. Other areas in the pharmacy is going to be a space for the pharmacist to be able to talk to uh, insurance companies or perhaps a physician. Um, I already talked about the area where pharmacy technicians might unpack the order. That, based on my experience, is also known as the reconstitution area. Uh, or the reconstitution area is actually known as wherever the compounding area is because it's all going to be done in one space. Usually in pharmacies, there is a sink because we always need to be able to wash our hands. So even in class, we have two sinks so that uh, we get familiar with those activities and those duties. Uh, so OTC, as a reminder, OTC stands for over the counter. And so this is where it is going to have the miscellaneous products of different items that a patient may use for various things, whether it's cough, cold, allergy, um, pain, uh, digestives, uh, first aid. These are just some aisles that is over the counter in the pharmacy department. So in continually talking about community pharmacy, there are some specific duties to each person that work in each section. The person who's responsible for inventory has to make sure that whenever they are putting inventory up, that they're putting the inventory in the right space and not confusing it with another item. Uh, the person who's at drop off has to make sure that they are continuously taking the patient's information. So if a person drops off a prescription, there are requirements of that person who is known as the data entry technician. And mostly everyone is cross-trained in the pharmacy department because that makes a strong pharmacy if everyone is cross-trained because you never know if someone may call out or might not be able to make it in. Uh, so some duties, some duties of a person who's working at a drop-off counter would uh, possibly be take, making sure they have the correct patient information 
and making sure that the medication is in stock before the patient leaves and making sure that they have verified the person's insurance and their medical and their medication history as well as their allergy history just using those for examples now for the placement of equipment and space utilized in the front area is important because the pharmacy is already a close-knit uh, space and so you just want to make sure you always have enough room um shelving this the shelving section uh based on how the pharmacy is uh oh now the shelving system based on how the pharmacy is it's going to have what's called fast movers and so this is if you visit a pharmacy and you see shelving that's facing the front, uh, those are known as fast movers. And fast movers is medications that's commonly being used in that pharmacy. So if the pharmacy staff, if they're filling a prescription, they might be able to quickly get a prescription. They might be able to get a medication quickly because it's known as a fast mover. Um, and then always in a busy pharmacy, it's always a constant need to restock uh, because they're always constantly using the medicine. So these are just some examples of what happens in the community pharmacy. Now, in an institutional pharmacy uh, that has an automated dispensing system that's better abbreviated as ADS. So that can have a Pixis machine, uh, which is something that holds the medicine and then the pharmacy staff can compute how many tablets or pills they need from the machine and the machine can actually make it for them um, because in a hospital setting is super busy and it's super critical to make sure everything is correct and accurate so uh, automated dispensing system might be used to assist in those functions now when medications are provided in a hospital setting, um, they could be computerized. So that would go through a CPOE, which stands for Computerized Physician Order Entry. Uh, so in a hospital setting, it could have a order entry area. Now, additionally to that, it could also have an emergency or disaster medication supply room. So that's a specific area that's meant for a disaster preparation. Um, the, in a institutional pharmacy, they also have the filling area with the pickup window. And then also in the institutional pharmacy, they have a pneumatic tube. And remember, that's the tube where they can input medicine and then it can go towards different floors. Uh, just using that as an example. Now, also in the institutional pharmacy, you have the inventory area, and then they also have the storeroom. So in the inventory area, this is where all the medicine is. And when they get ready to use it, they can uh, pick the correct item from the shelving. In the institutional pharmacy, they also have what's called an IV room. The IV room, IV stands for intravenous. That is where they are injecting IV bags with medicine and pharmacy technicians are trained to do that. But remember, everything that is done by a pharmacy technician must be checked by a licensed pharmacist. So that is something the pharmacy technician can assist with in performing those duties. Uh, as a FYI, the IV room is also known as the clean room. So if ever you hear it being referred to as the clean room, that's what that represents. Now, you might think, well, why is it called the clean room? It's mainly in part because everything in there has to have a certain, uh, it has to keep being sterile. So it's a sterile environment. So it has to continue to keep the room clean. Now, uh, there's also an area in the institutional pharmacy setting uh, that's known as the narcotics area. And this is where the controlled substance medications are kept. Uh, you also have in the institutional pharmacy what's called an operating room tray or known as an OR tray. This is where if there is an emergency, uh, this 
particular cart is stocked and stacked with everything that a uh, uh, operating room or an emergency room would need. This could also be known uh, to be utilized with a crash cart, which again is always kept stock um, just in case uh, it's needed. Now, some other areas of the institutional pharmacy would be a repackaging area. This is where the medicine that is used for bulk uh, could be used or sh could be broken down to unit dose. So that means the patient might uh, use it once or twice so they can package unit dose medication. I've listed here what that looks like. So this is what's called a blister card. Um, and so this could be repackaged and it could even be sealed. Now for it to be sealed, mostly uh, they have what's called a cold seal and that's where the film would be taken off of the back and then they can close it uh, to make sure that the medicine doesn't fall out. And then also in the institutional pharmacy, they have a stocking area for the non-clinical area and for other departments in case someone needs to communicate with the pharmacy staff. So basically, the layout of a hospital pharmacy usually consists of a large room and it's divided by counters or petitions with some offices. So overall, the layout of the hospital pharmacy has the CPOE area. So in a community setting, that's known as the drop off area in the in, in the hospital pharmacy that's known as the computerized um, order entry area and then you have the automated dispensing area that's where the medicine is going to be automatically dispensed from a machine such as maybe a Pixis machine and then you have different inventory areas and then you definitely always have the IV room and that is where pharmacy staff will be performing sterile compounding. So now that I've talked about some of the layouts with community pharmacies and institutional pharmacies, let's next learn about some different ways of how um, efficiencies can be improved, especially with the techniques. So when the proper workflow and management are put into place, a pharmacy can provide quality and safe patient care while minimizing time and expenses. Um, now, it's always important to make sure that you are double checking, triple checking your work, because if there is an error, then that's going to be costly, not just in money, but it can cost someone their life if we are not paying very close attention. Now, the layouts of the facilities, uh, utilizing the utilization of educated and trained technicians, as well as making sure that there are standards of practice for um, the establishment that provides a solid foundation for success. So that's why um, when a person is registered uh, using our state, the state of Florida, for example, us becoming registered pharmacy technicians, it ensures that we are always have continuing education in our field so we can make sure that we continue to be educated. And then taking additional trainings is going to help us to have a better foundation for success. So there are some different ways to get started. One of the main ways to get started is to establish a baseline because that's key. You want to identify any problem um, and what causes that problem and what it's caused uh, so it can lead to ways to improve or change a process if needed. It's kind of like if you were driving a car. There are different ways to get to a, your destination, but you want to make sure that as you're driving, you're driving carefully and being alert. So the same thing can be said in your career as a pharmacy technician. You want to make sure that you're performing uh, accurately and effectively. So you want to make sure that everything is working the way that it should be. Now, quality control is taking established plans and discussion and making them into activities that prevent an error or make a better process. So uh, ways that this can be done would be uh, having meetings with the pharmacy staff and learning what is already in place and see where some areas can be improved. 
uh, mostly in most pharmacies, there is always communications uh, in regards to staff meetings and, you know, having a focus. So uh, these are some things that can be definitely helpful in the workflow setting. Now, there are some ideas for the community setting, and this could be to keep movement to a minimum, which can help by saving time and having unnecessary steps. Um, you want to align with the work areas to flow with the order of processes. So, for example, when a person comes in to fill the prescription, they're going to come in and drop it off. We're talking about a community setting. They're going to come in, drop the prescription off. The technician that's at the drop off window is going to ask the necessary questions, make sure that the medication is in stock, as well as fill the medication, get the medication checked by the pharmacist. Uh, the pharmacist is then going to do a drug utilization review to make sure that that medication is not going to be working against anything else that the patient is taking. And then when that medication is ready to be picked up, the pharmacy technician that is at the pickup counter can confirm the patient's date of birth and also uh, offer counseling. Now, when counseling is offered, that does not mean the technician can do it. That means they are merely asking the patient if they would like to speak to the pharmacist. And that has to be offered, um, especially to patients uh, uh, who are on new prescription. Um, other ways to uh, some other ideas for working in the community setting is to use um, automation and some technology to assist in error prevention, which can assist with being efficient and accurate. You want to reduce some interruptions. So that means if you are in the process of doing something, complete one task before you get distracted into another because that could also cause an error and you want to always try to assign um, tasks that matches the person's knowledge or expertise and then it's definitely beneficial to, to be a cross-trained technician so if ever you were working in a setting ask them if you could be cross-trained so that you can be well versed in all areas of the setting so that's actually going to complete chapter 15 uh, in regards to our lecture today.